Hello everyone, so this is just going to be a quick video on two intermediate kind of freestyle methods or more just methods that people use as kind of a bridge between M2 and Old Pachman and full on freestyle. And so the two methods are called Ika, E-K-A, e and Orozco, Orozco, not quite sure what the accent is on that, but anyways, um, both have been gaining a significant amount of traction recently, and they both have their d detractors and their supporters, so I thought we would just uh, get into a quick definition of what they are and then my thoughts on them. So, um, first of all, we have Ika. So Ika is um, essentially a method where if you have like a cycle, so right here we have UF, um, LB, LU, what you would do is you would set up one of these pieces to a specific piece, no matter how bad the setup move might be. You, you, you would you'd want to set it up to, uh, let's say UR, I think is a common one. So you set it up to UR, then you do the UR column. So then it'll be here to here to here. So uh, the idea here is that you only know the commutators for one set, I guess, maybe two if you do that, but you would go here and you know commutators from here to here and to wherever else on the cube, and I guess inverses too. And the same thing with corners, you would have another piece that you would always set up to, you know, like you have something like this, to here to here, and instead of doing like that, you would do a B setup move, so you would have one of the stickers up here at UBR, and then you could just do a UBR com. Oops, <laughs> I'm not used to doing it this way. So um, yeah, the idea again is that you don't have to learn many commutators, and you just set up to the ones that you do know. So before we get into pros and cons, let's look at what a Rosco is. So a Rosco is um, one where it's not unlike Ika, you're not solving two pieces at a time. So Ika is basically just sometimes really bad commutators. Um, a Rosco is where you have a helper piece. So you, you again, you use all the commutators from your buffer to let's say UBR a helper piece, but um, you're only solving one piece at a time. So right here, I have the cycle uh, UFR, LFD, LBD. So instead of doing that commutator, just the normal commutator, what I would do is I would shoot this to, to here and then to here. So that's my helper piece. So I go like that. And then I would go helper piece again to the second target of that free cycle we started with. Like that. So there you're only doing one um, con you're only doing one piece at a time, but the idea here is that you're not using any inefficient setup moves or bad commutators. you're just using um, so-called objectively optimal or just basically you ask a fast person for it um, commutators from one piece and then to any other piece in the cube. And the same thing for edges, I guess. Some people would use U, R, U, B, whatever. But that's the general principle behind the two methods. So now let's get back into what um, the pros and the cons are of the methods themselves. And at the end, I'll talk about whether any of these methods are good, in my opinion. <laughs> so for Ika, I'd say the major pro over Orozco is the intuitive nature of it. So Orozco, you're just doing commutators. It's a bit like a glorified old Pachman. You're you, like, you know, you just, you memorize 20 commutators or 40 commutators with both edges and corners as algs. I don't know how many they are. Don't quote me on math. But anyways, you memorize them as algs and then you're just doing them. You're just spamming. It's like M2 or old Pachman. It's not, um, it's not very hands-on mentally. Um, then Ika, we have 
intuitive computation, more intuition, more tracking pieces moving around the queue while you're blindfolded. That's a really good plus because a lot of people don't realize how important that is, even when you know full commutators with cancellations and floating and maybe you made a mistake in memo and you just glimpse one flipped edge and you kind of have to figure out where the other ones are. It, it adds up and it helps with the times a lot more than you might think it does. I don't know, I was surprised. So that's a huge plus is developing that more intuitive sense of the cube. Obviously the big uh, kind of detractor to Ika is the, um, the bad comms that you'll eventually do. The one I'm talking about right now, this one is actually pretty good, but um, you might have one with like four setup moves. I don't know, something like that. Um, so th that's a pretty big detractor is you might be able to, you might be a bit stuck in your ways if you do that for a long time before transitioning to full three style and you might be stuck with a lot of um, really inefficient comms. So yeah, that's that's the main two things with Ika is that on the one hand you are developing a really intuitive sense of the cube, which is really important and you're probably going to understand commutators better. On the other hand, you're doing some very inefficient comms because you're restricting yourself to only using one piece. So those are the, yeah, those are the two things that uh, are big for Ika. And then for Orozco, um, so again, this one is just, even with the inefficiency of Ika, it's going to be way faster than Orozco, I promise you. Just because Orozco, you're going to have well, you're doing two ALGs for every one Ika, and let's say even if the Ika is slightly slower than a Rosco, my guess is that if you're doing the intermediate methods, your think ahead isn't like incredible. No offense to people who do use these methods, I'm just, it's just an assumption. So there's going to be pauses. So with um, a Rosco, you're going to be pausing twice as much and doing twice as many ALGs compared to Ika. So yeah, that's the big thing. And then also you're not really developing an intuitive sense of the cube. Again, it, like what I said, it was just a, it's a glorified old Pockman. And so it, it's just, you're treating it like algorithms. You're not treating com, comms like intuitive things that you can learn. You're not treating it like F2L, basically. You're treating it like PLL. And I know if you can get around that and if you can get on to forcing yourself to essentially learn two sets, two different um, sets of ZBLL for edges and corners, because if that's how you're, you want to learn commutators is by, just by memorizing 400 of them. I mean, all the power to you, go ahead. But I just think that for a lot of people, especially myself, that's really discouraging. And I would be surprised and impressed if someone made it to world-class level by following the same kind of thing that Orozco teaches with just memorizing commutators. So yeah, that's the big thing with Orozco for me. But the benefit, again, is that you are using objectively optimal um, comms, at least for the, the helper pieces. So you're not developing any extraordinarily bad habits like you might with Ika. I'm not saying you will with Ika, but you might if you use, you know, like, I don't know. It's hard to figure. <laughs> useless B moves. <laughs> Anyways, that's, um, that's, that's in general my, my thoughts on these two methods. I've been, I've been taking a few days to think them over and uh, yeah. Now getting on to just the idea of these methods in general, I think there's a couple things that people kind of ignore when they try and think of intermediate methods. And so the first thing I would say is you have to consider what your goals are. If your goal is to be averaging one minute, I mean, why even bother doing this? Why not just do M2? I mean, Lucas Eder just got like a 30 something, 34 maybe, official single with M2 and Old Pockman. And while not everyone has his turns per second ability, it's not that hard to get down to low one minute with M2 Old Pockman. So if your goal is to just, you know, maybe podium at a local competition or something like that, ask yourself how much effort you want to put into this. If your goal is to be world class, Again, you need to ask yourself what kind of effort you're willing to put into this. Because in my opinion, this is not really a good bridge. I don't think there's really a, a good way to bridge into world-class top methods. I think the best way to do it is just bite the bullet and go for, go for it. So, you know, learn commutator theory and 
then just do a lot and a lot of sided solves. That's all I really did. You know, I was one of those annoying kids who cubed in school a little bit, and I really regret that for some reasons, but also I think it really helped to develop my intuitive sense of commutators, which I think is moderately good, if I do say so myself. And I think that that's a huge benefit to people. So maybe you have, if you started from UBL with, with old Pachman, and then you just immediately go to commutators, you would have like this one, this one, this one. I probably used that commutator at one point. Something pretty bad compared to... But, you know, the idea is that you're developing a better sense of the cube, and you will optimize later. Or let's say if I was doing um, DF or here to here to here, maybe I did... you know, something that's not very good. But I was still developing a better intuitive sense of the cube. And I think in the long run that helped me because no matter how much you th say, oh, I'm gonna start from the beginning and I'm gonna learn everything perfectly so I never have to do it again, that's never gonna happen. I'm just telling you right now, that's not going to happen. You might think you're smarter than everyone else. You might think that you have better precautions or not precaution, but you know, you have better planning and you know exactly what you're going to do. You're going to learn 10 things per day and you're going to practice this and this. That never happens. Like that just doesn't happen. And I don't think it should happen. I don't think you should waste your life like that. I think it's more fun to figure them out on your own and then optimize later because you're still developing a lot of skills. I mean, even if, let's say you average three minutes and then you switch to commutators, you still got to get your memo way down. You got to increase your turns per second, your think ahead. None of that really matters. I mean, in terms of what method you use. So you've got to try a lot of different things. Don't don't just stick to someone you message on Facebook. Don't just stick to their advice. Take some time. Figure some exit on your own. Make it fun for yourself. Because, I mean, in the long run, unless you do end up being, you know, like, well, you know, sub 20 or something like that, like at the level where you can be competitive for world records and championships and that sort of thing, it, it's not going to have any huge benefit for you to waste your life memorizing a bunch of Alex that you never end up using. Because, I mean, that's the thing is when you're doing intuitive comms, you're constantly trying new things and you're constantly experimenting. And that's what keeps the magic going for a lot of people. So, yeah, that's kind of a long-winded ramble about that, but that's that's just... My idea is that, you know, there's a lot of good skills you develop from f taking this journey on your own. And I think that if I did the journey again, if I had to start from beginner, being a beginner again, I would 100% do the same things that I did. I would 100% do, um, that. For this case again because in my beginner mind that was the best thing I could do after watching Noah's tutorial instead of you know you live and you learn and I don't seem to be ha uh, have been harmed by doing that and I don't think other people will too so yeah that's my opinion on Ika Orozco and intermediate three style methods in general so yeah my advice bite the bullet Take the plunge and start using full commutators. You won't regret it. All right, thanks. See you later. I'll try and post some more videos next week and maybe a video of some solves with this new cube, which you may have noticed is an SM. Yes. Very interesting. I need to set it up a bit more. And yeah, stay tuned. All right, see you later.